So thank you everybody for joining. And I, I, I wanna make, the, make it very clear, as you see from the, the list of names on, on the presentation, this is a very big effort. So the Serial Systems Initiative for South Asia or CISA, it, it, it's really, a, it's a long-term project that it's been operating for some time, but it's a, it's a large team effort across CGIR centers operational in South Asia. And beyond the names of the, the scientists and technical staff that you see here, there's countless, uh, in some ways, other partners, uh, farmer organizations, private sector partners, and others that are involved in all of our efforts. And without them, uh, none of what I'll talk about will, was, would be possible. But we're going to go through a very quick presentation, so hold on to your seats. We have a lot to cover. I'm going to tell you about the background of CISA, then we're going to take you on a, a quick tour through Bangladesh, Nepal, and a little bit through India and talk about some of our cross-cutting policy work. Then we'll talk about how COVID-19 is affecting CISA and what we're doing, and then we'll conclude. So CISA basically was, was developed and, and started in 2009 to address the map that you see on the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, the purpose was to address the, the dense poverty problems that we see in, in rural agricultural production systems throughout South Asia with a concentration in the eastern Indo-Gangetic Plains, which is where you see Bangladesh, the state of Bihar, and parts of uh, coastal uh, India uh, and Nepal. Yeah. C C says it, it's a large um, project that's really become a program, but what we aim for is looking for how science-based analytics, targeting of, of appropriate agronomic and genetic technologies, uh, multi-stakeholder platforms, market-based approaches, and supportive policy can address the issues that we see with, with poverty um, in, in cereal-based farming systems in South Asia. And really what the project is about is, is this graph. Um, this summarizes almost everything that we try to do. But if you, if you look sort of at the, the y-axis of this graph here, where you see fundamental technology research, uh, and basic engineering and research, very often there's this valley of death between that kind of research to applied research, but more importantly, getting technologies and practices into farmers' hands and also the private sector's hands so they can actually adopt it and, and make research of value. So what CISA is about is trying to bridge this valley of death, and that's almost everything that we've done with the project while also trying to do very credible and sound scientific research. Um, CISA is also unique in that it's a, currently a CGIR consortium of CIMIT, IFPRI, and ERI, although we have a wide variety of other partners who are involved with us, and you'll see that highlighted in a few slides. Um, but USAID Washington supports us in Nepal and in Bangladesh, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation very kindly supports us to work in India. And we run it as an integrated eco-regional project. Um, in the locations that we work, we work across a diversity of interesting environments that have different challenges. We work in the hill and plateau environments in Nepal and also in parts of Odisha in India. We also work in coastal environments in India and in Bangladesh and new unique challenges in Cox's Bazaar in Rohingya crisis impacted communities. And our sort of stronghold and where much of our experience is, is the work in the Indo-Gangetic Plains or the flatlands of the region uh, where rice and wheat are widely grown. Uh, heat stress is a major issue for crops um, and where markets are, are relatively weak but can be more strongly developed. CISA, or what we call the base CISA that's been supported by USAID Washington, has gone through three phases from 2009 um, then through a second phase, and we're currently in the third phase, and we've recently been extended to the end of 2021. But as the project has moved forward, we've gone through distinct approaches. In the first phase, we did what was called sort of packing the technology pipe pipeline. We did a lot of agronomic and socioeconomic research. There was a breeding component for developing stress-tolerant crops. We did demonstrations and trainings. As we moved into the second phase, uh, we looked at a broader set of impact pathways. We broadened our e research agenda. We got a little bit more complex. We really looked at increasing our impact by working through intermediaries and partners. And we had a strong focus on developing um, service provision through machinery operators, which I'll speak about, and more demonstration and training. 
But then as we moved into the, the third phase, um, we've really, really targeted our research art and, and development work for responsive and adaptive research that's very meaningful. Um, we've done a lot of work on institutional and systematic change within institutions to support our goals. We do far less direct training and much more training of trainers through partners. And we strongly focus on catalyzing public and private sector partnerships. So this is a, a slide that tries to describe how CISA works because we've got two donors that work together. We've got three countries. We've got a very large and diverse team working in many different areas. But what's most important to draw from this is that the three countries learn strongly from each other. We have a shared management committee across the overall program, and we have scientists that work across countries. We are in regular daily contact with each other. So there's a lot of learning and adaptation and use of similar methods and approaches throughout the countries, but they are custom not customized for local circumstances. Another thing that's very important about CISA that makes it different from many other programs and projects is that our staff are long-term. We live in the countries that we work in. Many of us have been based here for many, many years. And that being based in place for a very long time means that we build a lot of social capital with our public and private sector partners that enables us to function very efficiently and it means that we're a little bit different than projects that might sort of helicopter in to start a project for three to five years and then leave. The places that we work are our homes, the relationships that we manage are personal, and that strengthens the science and the development work that, that we do. And that's been evidenced, I think, because um, CISA has really developed from just a project into an integrated program. Um, we've attracted 11 additional um, investments in CISA. So we have side projects that are working in synergy with CISA. And those include investments very strongly from USAID Bangladesh, also from the mission in Nepal, um, support from some of the CGIR research programs and complementary investments now also from Michigan State uh, University. So I'll take you on a tour of the region first starting with Bangladesh. And I'll tell you in each of these mini tours a little bit about some of the things that we do in each country. One of the core things that CISA has focused on is rural mechanization and addressing labor um, costs and scarcity that has emerged in a lot of South Asia. But we don't address that just by going out and saying that farmers should use any kind of machine. We focus on the concept of scale appropriate machinery. And that's because not all rural landscapes are the same. A uh, landscape in Iowa, these are satellite images of a one and a half square meter area in Iowa versus India versus Bangladesh. And in each of those different locations, different kinds of equipment will be needed that are appropriate for the small field sizes that farmers face in South Asia, but also for the limited investment and risk bearing capacities of the farmers that we work with. So we focus our technological work and our research work on equipment that we know is appropriate and try to align that with partners and market systems to support um, the research outcomes in particular engineering work and particular agronomy work around machinery to be scaled out. In Bangladesh in particular, our work focuses on addressing the very uh, fast increasing uh, daily uh, labor wage rate in rural areas. Believe it or not, there is a rural labor scarcity problem in much of Bangladesh, especially at acute periods for planting and for harvesting. There's increasing en energy costs, decreasing land availability. Where, where young people are interested in um, employment, they almost always wish to move outside of agriculture for something else. And that is really changing the rural landscape. Um, I was amazed when I first saw that when I came to Bangladesh, uh, almost nine years ago that you know a country with more than 170 million people that's very small actually has a labor scarcity problem but everywhere you go you talk to farmers and it's true people have migrated abroad people are working in cities people are moving out of agriculture so we're trying to respond adaptively but in a positive way and we've done that by introducing particular types of machines that can be beneficial in helping farmers and also service providers who operate uh, the machines and provide services to farmers on an affordable fee for service basis. 
But we do that through testing. And as you see in the graph on the left-hand side, this compares uh, farmers' practice for um, sowing of wheat by hand and, and general tillage versus using specialized machinery. And all of the points that you see on the um, above the one-to-one -one line in, in red and in gray are points where the machinery um, that has been introduced by the project and where, that we've researched has been found to be more profitable than what farmers generally do on their own. And with that research evidence and information, we were able to take that forward. We're able to show, for example, to service providers who own machines that they can actually assist farmers. And what we're really looking for in this is, is what you see on the graph on the um, right-hand side of the screen. We want machinery owners and service providers to spend less time serving farmers, but to profit more from each farmer that they are serving compared to conventional equipment, for example, by using equipment like this power tiller operated seeder that also allows you to seed as well as till the field. But it's important that it also benefits farmers in a win-win situation. So this machinery reduces costs and also dramatically increases profits for farmers because they save on their own labor, um, transaction cost time, opportunity cost time, working on farm and, and otherwise. So this makes things very attractive. And another point that's important about machinery, as, as we found, is that there are a lot of indirect benefits. Uh, typically, for example, during harvesting period, when you have labor gangs that are working to harvest fields like this, we found that women who's, uh, who are the wives of, uh, of husbands who manage the operations in the field in Bangladesh have to spend a considerable amount of time preparing food to serve to laborers who are typically harvesting crops manually. And what we did was study that by looking at the implications of, of reaper machinery like this on women's activities in a 24 hour period. And what we found is that the introduction of this machinery dramatically changed the, the, the allocation of time that women had to particular activities. Um, and unfortunately, I accidentally cut off the, the differences here, but what you will see is that women would have more time for leisure, more time to spend with children, more disposable income, um, that they could generate from activities and working uh, in, in gardens and, and other such things. Uh, one of these was just more time to be able to sleep during harvesting period. So we see that the, this kind of machinery and the use of this kind of machinery actually frees women's time in ways that you would not notice if you did not look outside of the agricultural field. And so there are a lot of potential benefits. One of the synergistic projects that is developed with CISA was supported by USAID Bangladesh through uh, an investment that was called the CISA Mechanization and Irrigation Project that recently completed its first phase. And what we did is we worked with the evidence that I sort of just discussed, um, but we, and we introduced that research evidence to different firms, to financial service providers, to mechanics and extension services, and we developed a market ecosystem around encouraging machinery and machinery growth. And over the five years of that project, um, 3,474 machinery service providers were developed that did not exist before, that are now serving more than 300,000 farmer clients on 135,000 hectares throughout Bangladesh. But well, more importantly, that also comes with an ecosystem of mechanics, machinery dealers, spare spart shops, and large companies, and also SMSEs that have been developed as part of supporting this kind of work. And most importantly also is that we didn't do this on our own. The research data that we were able to collect around particular machines were, was useful in, in providing um, business evidence to the companies that we worked with. And over the five years of the project, the private sector actually invested $6.7 million of their own funds in importing, assembling, and actively sell, selling the kinds of machines that I just spoke about on the previous slides. So that was a big success, and the CISA MI project has now moved on to its second phase with a new name, and that is the CISA mechanization and extension activity. And that activity is actually going upstream. It's going beyond the production of machinery, or sorry, the, the field activities of machinery alone and working with service providers and farmers, but we're actually working now to develop um, the industry of making, manufacturing, assembling, 
and supply chain work around small scale and appropriate agricultural machinery in Bangladesh. And that's being done through uh, boosting com competitiveness. Uh, that's being done through institutional capacity development for machinery workshops, and especially the development of skilled youth workforces that can work on this machinery. And we also continue to work around service provision and mechanization and making sure that farmers are able to benefit in the ways that I just discussed with a focus in the Feed the Future zone, but also in communities that have been impacted in southwestern Bangladesh by the Rohingya um, refugee crisis as well. So you'll learn more about that project as it advances and it continues until 2024. We've also worked in Bangladesh on land use intensification. The government of Bangladesh has been very interested in addressing this issue of dry season land fallowing in southern Bangladesh and in the Feed the Future zone. And as you see this from this photograph from an airplane that was taken during February, there's a lot of land that is not cropped that could be put into productive use. One of the ways that we're interested in seeing it being put into productive use is through efficient irrigation, which is another topic we've worked on quite widely. But the question as scientists that came back to us, when you have limited investment capacity in a project and government has a large uh, envelope of land to address, where do you actually target irrigation and how do you do that kind of work? Well, we approach that through science and use of remote sensing tools. And that was done basically by using satellite imagery to look at patterns of land use in Southwestern Bangladesh and identify areas that were seasonally fallow. We overlaid that with information on the dynamics of soil and water salinity and water availability. And what we were able to do with that was map fallow land, low intensity land and high intensity use land and identify areas that might be um, available for reliable cropping through use of surface water irrigation from canals um, that could be used to grow a second crop during the dry season. Now, this is a nice piece of science, but it's not really useful to anyone beyond publishing a paper unless you take it the next step forward. So while doing this research, we kept our partners at the USAID mission um, informed of what we were doing, and we facilitated additional support from USAID Bangladesh, where they invested in, um, in um, parts of the government of Bangladesh to guide the rehabilitation of canals that could be used to um, to irrigate crops with surface water as you see below and in order to do that they made use of the analysis that i just discussed on the last page through a geographic information system that we put together and CISA guided our partners within the government to rehabilitate canals that could then be used for irrigation and dry season cropping 86 kilometers of canals were rehabilitated and that resulted in more than 10,000 tons of new crops being produced per year from land that was previously fallow. We've also worked in Bangladesh on, on pests and diseases and everybody on the call probably is aware of fall armyworm. But fall armyworm has spread quite widely throughout the globe and become a big problem. It's moved from Africa into Asia. It's a a hungry little bugger, I could say. Uh, it's a difficult pest to work with, and it invaded Bangladesh in 2018. But thankfully, we had projects like CISA and good support from USAID Bangladesh that were able to put us into place for addressing um, the threat of fall armyworm. And we were able to put together, working um, with colleagues who are on the call today, a small additional investment that was put through Michigan State University with the support of USAID in Bangladesh and the Be Heard program to start addressing fall armyworm in Bangladesh. And we did that in many different ways, but we've had a couple big successes. Most recently, for example, we've focused on public private partnerships and supporting the private sector to get new safe uh, products into the market that can be used against fall armyworm. And normally, when you want to bring a new product to the market in Bangladesh, it takes more than 20 to 26 months of time for doing multiple location trials, for doing lab work, and just going through bureaucratic procedures to get pest control products registered. One of the things that we wanted to do though in this emergency situation was accelerate that and bring that time down very shortly. And so we did that by working with our task force on fall armyworm in country, 
knowing policy within country, having convening power as CISA, and having knowledge of science and how to work with, uh, with doing research that could address the problem quickly. And we were able to set out um, several rapid experimental trials throughout the country in partnership with the Bangladesh Agricultural Research Institute to test two products. The first one being Fologen, which is a naturally occurring virus that targets only um, fall armyworm and you spray it like a pesticide, but the virus is, it's a biological um, control technique, if you will. You spray it, it infects the fall armyworm, it causes fall armyworm to come sick and die, and it even self-replicates within the crop, but it's safe to all other organisms. We recently, just last week, were able to see that product registered, and we were able to do that in eight months' time rather than the usual 20 to 26 months' time by working with our partners in Bangladesh in this emergency situation. Um, that product, I should say, is produced by a company called AgBiTech that is based in Texas, and we've also working, we're working with them on marketing plans with Ispahani Agro Limited, a Bangladesh-based firm that is going to be the first mover on the product. We've also worked with Syngenta to see a product called Fortenza, which is a seed treatment. It's a systematic insecticide that um, provides uh, uh, control against fall armyworm in the first few weeks of the crop, and that's also been recently registered. We see that as beneficial in some ways because while it is an insecticide, it is lower toxicity than many of the products that are typically used in country. And it is also something that is not directly sprayed on the field. So you have reduced non-target and, and human health and ecotop risks with the product. But we don't also just work on those products. We're also starting work with it in Bangladesh on biological control options and supporting their market development around particular biological control options for parasitoids as well. We also developed Bangladesh's first ever digital um, doing that. In just six months of this additional synergistic project that's been supported by, by Michigan State um, and by USAID, uh, we've had national television coverage of our trainings. We've trained more than 1,700 input dealers who have given advice to more than 50,000 farmers. We trained intensively a small cadre of 754 uh, extension agents who then went on to reach 74,000 farmers throughout Bangladesh and providing advice. And what's really important from that is that extension services based on the data that they collect and the trainings that they had advise farmers not to apply pesticides three times more frequently than they did advise farmers that pesticide by getting meteorological forecasts from Bangladesh Meteorological Department. We integrate that information into a spatial model that is run with a mathematical algorithm of spore growth and development. And what happens is that we are now able, now able to generate Five day within a, a year and a half later, we were able working in partnership with the government and messages for um, for mothers of young children um, on on how to uh, improve the nutrition of, of of their their children. More importantly, though, also is that this was driven by assisting farmers. When we calculated how much farmers were able to profit from growing mung bean and inserting a third crop in what was otherwise a double. Uh, cropping pattern, we estimated that these 8,000 farmers in aggregate made approximately $1.75 million. And we are continuing to work to expand Mungbeam now. We're also doing a lot of Gokul Paudel uh, in Nepal, who's done really, really excellent, wonderful work analyzing data from very, very large scale surveys of farmers. And we've been able, using machine lear learning algorithms, to uh, give recommendations for refining fertilizer rates by location. We've been able to give specific advice on appropriate sowing dates in Nepal, advice on secondary and micronutrients, and where and when irrigation is most necessary. And this information is then pushed back out through our governmental partners in Nepal to farmers at a large scale so they can benefit from it. This work also informs policy. Um, some of the evidence where we were able to advise government par partners from Bangladesh, Nepal, India, and also Sri Lanka on more appropriate methods of extending and uh, assuring balanced fertilizer application through policy. Like in Bangladesh, we work very strongly on agricultural machinery in Nepal. 
you see very rapid rates of increase of adoption of, of reapers like you see here. Uh, um, very, very big successes with developing service providers, as I discussed in Bangladesh, but in Nepal, many of them are um, youth service providers. Uh, there's more than 14,000 young service providers operating mini tillers, operating reapers, operating irrigation pumps and zero till drills throughout Nepal. And very importantly, many of these service providers are providing direct benefits to women headed households which is important because in much of Nepal with rural out migration that has occurred over the last few years, there's an increasing number of women headed households where men have moved to other countries or migrated for labor. And it, we're able to help service providers target these service to benefit, um, benefit women. But this is all of course done by really working on different financing options and working with dealers. Um, of agricultural machinery and advising them on appropriate machinery and helping to facilitate markets. Now, moving from Nepal into India. Again, the components of CISA in India are supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And I saw earlier that my colleagues, Peter Crawford and Balwinder Singh and others are on the call and they lead the efforts in, in, in much of India. But India is, is an important case because we focus strongly on institutional change and long-term commitments to improving the way that serial systems work in India. CISA is a, a very well-trusted, I should say trusted, not rusted, partner of state and, and, and central levels of government in India. There's strong integration of research into development working within state systems, and there's strong participation in policy and decision-making by our scientists that are based in India. And some of the evidence of impact that's come are wheat. There's been huge successes in reduced and zero tillage work in India. There's more than 90,000 hectares of zero till wheat now in Bihar. This increases farmers' incomes in aggregate by more than $9 million a year. Crop yields go up by about a quarter ton per hectare. But more importantly, we're reducing the use of diesel by using zero tillage, which doesn't require um, lots of multiple passes of a, of a cultivator in a field, but allows you to seed directly. And that also therefore reduces carbon dioxide emissions dramatically. Another concern in India is crop residue burning. I'm sure many of you have heard about the pollution problems that are occurring in India when people burn rice residues. So there's been a lot of work done in India on a research side to address this issue, but also engineering work to develop appropriate cedar technologies. We work very much on something called the happy cedar, as it's been branded, um, where we've had policy innovations that have resulted in more than 11,000 happy cedar uh, cedars being sold um, between 2018 and 19. And the happy cedars are wonderful because you, you do not have to burn rice residue before planting. These are zero till machines that directly plant into high level levels of residue, as you see on the photograph on the lower right. Beyond the work in each country, we have cross-cutting work on policy, and that focuses on five core areas. We work at serial market outlooks, cultural input policies, risk management and insurance strategies, ways to accelerate scale appropriate machinery, and extension policy, particularly around fertility management, and also now through uh, at controlling fall armyworm. And this is also importantly done by close partnerships with other Feed the Future uh, projects and programs. Some of the outputs that um, we have had through the policy work, uh, which I should say strongly is led by the IFPRI team within CISA, but with the support of both SIM and ERI as an integrated whole, um, we've had impacts across the countries. I'll first mention uh, Nepal. In Nepal, um, we've been able to uh, strongly advise government on subsidy schemes for, uh, for soil fertility and balanced soil fertility management. This remains an ongoing issue that needs to be addressed continuously. Um, CISA also works closely with the Nepal Seed and Fertilizer Project, which is a mission-funded investment in Nepal that, um, that, that benefits and acts on some of the policy reducted by CISA. Um, we also have had contributions to formulation of Nepal's uh, agricultural mechanization policy and also work around policy for enhancing the seed sector by linking Nepali businesses to Indian seed companies. 
Other important policy impacts include work in Bangladesh, where CISA has informed crop insurance programs to invest in stress tolerant varieties as part and parcel of weather index insurance schemes. There's been a large amount of work on informing the discourse for financial services that benefit smallholder farmers. And most importantly, we have seen BRAC and ADB picking up on research results from, uh, from CISA's policy group, where they're piloting insurance products that have been informed strongly by, what's, by the research that CISA has done. In India, we've also done research on soil health cards and soil fertility management. And learning from what was done in India, CISA has been able to advise two other governments within the region to avoid going down the same path as in use uh, more effective and less inefficient and less expensive fertilizer extension strategies within the region. And that's important because a large part of what we do is co-learning across the different countries. Beyond all of that work, we also document our work in, uh, with scientific evidence. Throughout the, prop, the history of CISA, we've managed to produce 127 peer-reviewed scientific publications, 150 of the presentation. Um, we are now facing um, very unusual times, as everybody knows. Uh, the impact of COVID-19 has also affected cereal production systems in South Asia. And CISA has started to do some work focusing on ways that we can help rebound the agricultural and food systems sector from the impacts of COVID-19. And I'll talk a little bit about that now. But before doing that, um, what I should mention is that, um, one second, um, that we've, we've seen um, a lot of issues emerging. And what CISA has done and what we've done across our programs is try to understand what is happening with respect to the COVID crisis and food systems. And we've done that um, by doing quick and rapid studies that are emerging as problems that will need to be addressed. These include the following. Despite permissions for agricultural activities and some influx of laborers from urban to rural areas and some repatriation of laborers back into different countries, we've seen that the harvesting of the winter season crop has been widely disrupted due to movement restrictions. And more importantly, even where there is labor available, many laborers are afraid to work in the field. So people have not been willing to go out and harvest the crop. We've seen large scale impacts for perishables, dairy fertilizer like Nepal or for seed like Bangladesh are starting to feel strained from reduced international trade across borders. There's been knock on effects throughout the food system beyond, uh, beyond what happens in a farmer's field and post harvest. We see effects in restaurants due to closures, markets and effects within um, food service industries and so on. And there's starting to be concern for the upcoming summer or Karif season crop. A recent study that was released by Pradhan in this year indicated that two thirds of the farmers in India from a very, very large survey across 43 districts, um, those farmers are inefficient seed to plant as much rice as they had planned for the coming uh, Karif season. As I speak, um, cyclone Amphan is also striking the coast near Kolkata in India, and the compound risks that are posed by the effect of the cyclone, and we're waiting to see how bad it will be, um, will, will definitely only exacerbate this involved in the project or involved in high level advising to the Secretary of Agriculture and the Ministry of Agriculture on COVID-19 response. We're working also very closely with FAO and the World Food Program and other relevant agencies on giving that advice. The CISA mechanization and extension activity in Bangladesh has been very successful in actually creating, creating jobs and assuring rice food security. The cost for labor is actually higher than normal, despite that there might be an increasing pool of labor available. In Bangladesh, we've also done this by developing social safe distance um, mobile agricultural mechanics who are able to be deployed and go out and help with breakdowns of equipment when and where needed. And we've assisted in, in making sure that those mechanics can go out and help farmers and help combine harvester operators in different locations. I should say also this is done very strongly by our strong integration with the Department of Agricultural Extension in Bangladesh 
And again, the established relationships that our technical teams and our scientists have with the extension department and others that make this kind of work possible. In India, we're assisting government to assure harvesting and planting equipment could be available through linkages to service providers in Bihar by supplying information on machine operators that can then be directed by government to assist farmers in a similar way. My colleagues in Nepal have recently deployed mass media campaigns blasting 10 times per day uh, across different radio stations in the Feed the Future zone, advising um, farmers on how they can um, uh, produce uh, their crops and harvest their crops using COVID, uh, COVID-10, uh, sorry, excuse me, COVID-19 safe crop management practices during lockdown. And we're also now working with Nepal's uh, mission to develop through co-design appropriate, appropriate employment generation responses to the COVID crisis through appropriate mechanization and irrigation activities that are likely to start soon and will continue um, at, throughout the next year and a half of CISA. So I've given you a lot to chew on there and a quick rapid presentation and a rapid tour through India, Nepal, and Bangladesh. I hope it was not too overwhelming, but we wanted to give you a good flavor for the different kinds of work that we do. I want to thank everybody for attending the presentation and I'd be very happy to take questions uh, at this time. Um, uh... Carol uh, Jenkins, our office director for the Center for Agriculture, has a question. Uh, if there is a specific write-up on, no, she has a comment on uh, the gender uh, in, uh, that she talked about, and she was very happy. And I think uh, we have some answers for her from one of your colleagues, but Carol will, will discuss with Tim on getting you a specific write-up on gender. Uh, but we have a, a question from Anna, uh, which says, have cooperative farmer groups formed to uh, help offset costs of purchasing and maintaining machinery? If so, are there digital financial services available to members? So that's a very good question because in many cases, people tend to focus on the idea members banding together in a group to purchase machinery and supply services to other farmers. And it, I, I don't want to diss the idea. Um, uh, many of my colleagues, for example, in Cox's Bazaar uh, in Bangladesh, have set up a telephone network where they're working as operators to relay requests from farmers for services to service providers and getting them to go and serve them despite some of the lockdown threats that we've had. This is a unique situation now because normally service provider watersheds are rather local and rather small. And so in many cases, most of the service providers we work with have not had a problem with, 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 with generating business. They, their business is often saturated because the demand is very, very high, okay? So there's apps like Hello Tractor and other things that are very good ideas and being used in Africa where you have less population dense areas, but where populations are dense, like in South Asia, typically we have seen that service providers have local watersheds for service provision and, and that they have no trouble finding farmer clients. The difference now is that COVID has turned the situation on its, on its head and it is now going to be more important for those kinds of linkages. So we're starting to look at opportunities for using digital services to make sure service providers operate profitable businesses, helping farmers in the future. But it's in process and under development. Okay, Tim, we have more questions. I, I For all of you, by the way, I don't think we'll be able to finish all the questions within three minutes, but I have copied the questions and we will uh, send to Tim and his colleagues and you, you, they might give you an answer. Lending to? And in many cases, banks are quite averse to lending to the agriculture sector because they see it as, as being quite risky. But the work that we actually have done is actually going to banks and to financial service providers and educating them, sitting with them, explaining the benefits of machinery, working to make sure that that's understood. Um, in the case of Bangladesh, for example, my colleagues from CISA Mechanization and Irrigation, we also partner very closely with International Development Enterprises, have spent a lot of time um, educating banks and serv financial service providers to get them to then move into uh, investments for, um, for the machinery. And a lot of that education is also aimed at education around time to break even and the amount of service provision and hectares and farmers that need to be served to break even. And that's built into an understanding of the financial services plan and also something that um, is, is 
uh, imparted upon service providers embarking on businesses serving farmers so they understand what they need to do in order to repay their loans. Um, Tim Russell, you are on the call, and if you would like, I would invite you to say something about that. Timothy Russell is now the chief of party for the CISA mechanization and extension activity in Bangladesh and is working very strongly on these issues right now. Tim, would you like to comment? Sorry, the, the, the requirement for credit actually depends on the on the value of the machine. So um, the smaller machines like power to operated seeders um, and threshing machines, they're largely purchased on cash. Uh, but we, there was in the CISA MI program a, a, a link to microfinance institutions uh, who were providing uh, credit to about 160 some um, uh, service providers to buy these smaller machines. The bigger what's happening now is we're getting much bigger, more expensive machines coming in, like tractors and combine harvesters. And with tractors, the the, the machinery uh, suppliers have had um, a practice of selling their machines on credit. So a, a farmer or an entrepreneur would only have to put a thirty percent deposit down, and, and then there'd be seventy percent that the uh, would credit to the. The, the machinery supply company uh, and over the years and this has happened over a few years the, the amount of credit held by these uh, tractor mainly tractor supply companies has become quite large we estimated to be about 70 million dollars of credit uh, is out there and some of that money will never come back um, and to uh, often to, to generate the the 30 percent which the the entrepreneur has to uh acquire they often um get that, that money also from microfinance institutes and paying quite high interest rates uh the provision of of credit from banks is is, is its infancy in bangladesh for uh entrepreneurs and we're beginning to look at other ways in which finance could come to uh, small businesses, small entrepreneur, entrepreneurs, small uh, machinery companies uh, through uh, different mechanisms such as leasing arrangements um, and non non formal banking arrangements, uh, which would involve uh, shared uh, equity shares and shared profits, uh, that type of finance. So. A lot of things we're working on, and it's all in the world of investigation and research um, and learning as we go along. But that's essentially what we're, we're working on. Great. Uh, we have yeah. a question from, um, uh, I believe, uh, was uh, Michael Masico, uh, who says that dry season following might be a forced action due to lack of rain. So is investment in appropriate irrigation equipment a possible pathway to use land in these dry periods hi michael um yes that that is the idea um throughout south asia we have a, a monomodal rainfall pattern so we have a, a summer monsoon and then as we move into the winter it becomes dry um and although there is a considerable amount of irrigation development in south asia it's quite concentrated in, in particular areas. And there's particular parts, for example, in Bangladesh, where we have a strong focus on this work in the South Central area, um, very, very limited development of, of irrigation. The, the great irony in all of that, again, as you saw in some of the slides, is that there is a lot of surface water that is available. So there's free flowing canals, um, and that water can be tapped for irrigation. The problem, however, as you saw on the slide, is that part of the year that water can be saline and not all canals um, have free flowing water all the time. They sometimes get blocked up by silt um, and sediments and all sorts of other things. And so that's why we did the, the kind of targeting analysis that I, that I showed you. And that's why we worked very closely. Again, I wanna give a, a strong thanks to the USAID Bangladesh mission because when they saw the research work that they did, that we were doing, they were able to mobilize local currency in support of the government of Bangladesh to use our research results to guide irrigation canal rehabilitation, which makes surface water irrigation more possible. So 
it's a matter of understanding what resources are available and what you need to do to be able to tap them. And that's what we did in, in that situation in particular. We have another question from Kurt Reinsma, who is in the private sector engagement group here at USAID. Uh, what are the environmental implications of converting coastal fallow land to production? In general, given given low lying fragility of the area, and also given the cyclone growing fragility of the area, is fallow land with nature cover better able to withstand coastal erosion, for example? That's a really interesting question, and it's one that we wrestled with. And uh, one, I could, I will send you a copy of the research paper that we we did on this topic, actually, because we <clears throat> we addressed some of those issues. But in many cases, these are um, during the the rainy season. This land is actually intensively cultivated and in rice, and so during the dry season, you have bare land fallows um, where some people might turn limited numbers of livestock out to graze on rice stubble, but it's other otherwise large extensive areas of absolutely bare ground. Um, and many of the areas that we've actually targeted for irrigation expansion as being most appropriate are a little bit further inland. They're not the, the very, very, very poor coastal areas where, for example, you might want to have a, an alternative land use, uh, for example, in replanting of man mangroves or other species that would help protect the coastal areas. So we focused those areas smartly, um, and that, that was actually part of our initial analysis on when and where irrigation can be developed. Um, I didn't talk about it, but we go through some length in the paper that we developed on this, and then that paper became um, the guide and the decision tool for um, USAID's further support in irrigation expansion and the work that we did with government. Um, but we also, uh, made an assumption in all of that work of maintaining at least, I, I believe it was a three meter buffer strip, a riparian buffer strip next to the canals and other locations, particularly for the purpose of reducing uh, the risk of erosion. And also because when you start growing crops on fallow land, you run into issues with potential, uh, potential issues with respect to leaching of nitrates and so on. So we built that into our analysis and accounted for it in the land use planning that we did um, as a way to not only maintain biodiversity, um, but but also to actually capture potential agricultural pollutants and to protect from irrigation. Uh, sorry, to protect from erosion while irrigating. Uh, I think I'm I'm trying to find the next question, so I might. Uh, um, uh, I think I'm scrolling down. I got the uh, oh. Uh, Tim, or uh, uh, one question I have is that uh, from Carol Jenkins is that how are the systems and bag controls for fall army worm replicated in India, in Nepal, and India? <clears throat> That's a good question, also. And um, I was hoping someone would ask that. So thank you. Um, in India, um, state state government is a powerhouse in India. So the response to fall army worm by state government has been very, very strong. And in many cases, they don't need a lot of our uh, direct help. And so we haven't worked strongly on that um, in India. <clears throat> Although CIMIT does um, have strong partnerships in India and CIMIT does advise a considerable amount on fall army worm in India, but it's not yet a part of the CISA program. In Bangladesh, we talked about that in the presentation today. In Nepal, we are starting to work very closely with other FTF partners um, and also other organizations on, on fall armyworm. Um, one of the leaders on fall armyworm work in Nepal is the Mission Supported Nepal Seed and Fertilizer Project, which is also led by CIMIT. Um, there's also the Kisan 2 project that has started to look at fall armyworm and other investments as well. Um, but Nepal is a complicated landscape at this point in time. Um, it took <coughs> Nepal several months um, after the detect or first detection of fall armyworm to formally announce that fall armyworm was a problem. And once it was announced, it took time for action to come together for fall armyworm response to be put into place. Conversely, in Bangladesh, before fall armyworm even arrived, we started working together and with strong leadership by USAID also to start responding and planning to fall armyworm. 
So we're a little bit behind in Nepal, but work is ongoing. Um, just this, e to this day, I was getting emails and discussions. There's work at looking at whether we can adapt the fall army war monitoring system that we developed in Bangladesh <coughs> to Nepal. So we're working on putting that together. Um, there's also work that's been done by CISA with the Nepal Seed and Fertilizer Project together where we have produced radio jingles and awareness raising information that's being broadcasted to farmers on fall armyworm. And one of the things that's uh, most important is that a couple of our staff members in CISA, but also CIMIT more generally, sit on the National Fall Armyworm Task Force in Nepal alongside colleagues from USAID. And we try to use our technical knowledge to advise as much as possible. So I think in Nepal, we will get there, but we're still catching up, for example, to the progress that's been made in, in Bangladesh. Uh, we have a question from uh, uh, Rob that I, I believe has been answered by um, one of your uh, colleagues. Um, uh, let me see. Um, uh, Rob uh, has a question that says that, um, uh regarding adoption of mung bean uh this one uh, he, the the economic analysis question that rob has has been answered by somebody i think uh, one of your colleagues that have answered him that they have the data and they're collecting purpose. but another question that rob has is regarding adoption of mung bean in nepal i recall early data on significant household consumption a nice side benefit but question does the initial success appear to be propagating on its own are more farmers adopting inserting mung bean in rotation? So that's also a, a good and appreciated question. And I, I al almost want to turn it around to Binium and ask Binium to ask the uh, to answer the question. Um, because Binium and our and a number of colleagues from the mission in Nepal uh, were in the field with us visiting mung bean farmers in late February, um, just before um, COVID started to become a really big issue. Um, the work on mung bean is very young. It's very fresh. We've started only a few years ago. Um, we found that farmers are still retaining approximately roughly half the mung bean that is produced for consumption, selling, if I recall correctly, about 40% of that and keeping about 10% give or take for seed. What is important though, is that if you go to these parts of Western Nepal, and you talk to farmers and you ask them, do you intend to grow more mung bean? You more or less get a resounding answer that is yes. And I think Binium can, can vouch for that. Um, there is a very strong interest in farmers continuing to grow mung bean and a lot of excitement around that. So we expect to see it grow as time goes on and we'll keep you posted on that as time goes on. Uh, absolutely, Tim. When we visited, we were, um, uh, I gave a UI presentation when I came back here where we saw the guy who who, who uh, uh, put mung bean in baby foods and everything, and it was the first time that I, at least from what I heard, that mung bean was produced uh, in, in in Nepal rather than importing it from uh, uh, Nepal, India mostly. So it was uh, uh, it was impressive and uh, uh, interesting question. Uh, I, I was very very happy to see uh, also its implication for nutrition as baby foods was it was. Uh, 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 used for baby food with hospitals and everything. So uh, very impressed. And then um, another question that I, uh, um, uh, I'd like for, by the way, first to say that we've also have very, very good comments here from Mark Visaki who said about, yes, great job on the follow land. Patricia Orlowitz from the Bangladesh mission who gave a sh good shout out to you guys. So a lot of uh, great uh, uh, here. Um, uh, there is a comment from also Kurt, another uh, who said that, can you comment on COVID direct impact on SMEs, which is small medium enterprises and ad service providers that have started up in recent years in part due to CISA's good work? So that also is a very good question. Um, my colleague Amjad Babu is also on the line, um, but we've launched, uh, well, in terms of machinery service providers, we have reached out to machinery service providers uh, on an informal basis and qualitatively tried to assess the constraints that they were they were facing. And we did find that in many cases, service providers were encountering a bit less business than normal. 
Um, but again, our work with the CISA MEA project and others worked to then link service providers so they could serve farmers. Um, but it, it's COVID's occurred only at a, you know, it's been roughly the last two months that it's a big deal. Um, and it will continue to become a bigger deal. Um, but during that period, it's been really only the harvesting period. And we're now moving into planting of the early rice crop. And then we will move into planting of the summer season rice crop and then harvesting of that crop in September, October, November. So we'll have to continue to see what the effect is on, on uh, machinery service providers. Although I anticipate based on what we're learning is that the demand for machinery will actually go up despite a reinflux of people to rural areas. Um, for the reasons that I stated before, that there's still a lot of fear about working in fields and and uh, logistical problems that prevent people from harvesting manually. Um, in, in terms of other SMSEs, um, we I, the reason I mentioned my colleague Amjath is that we've we've launched panel surveys that are occurring now on a weekly basis, of making calls to uh, not a nationally representative sample, but a uh, a spatially representative sample of um, service providers across Bangladesh to track the implications of COVID on their businesses. We've done the same for reaching out to agricultural input dealers to track what is occurring with respect to their businesses and availability of key inputs and business constraints on a, on a weekly basis. Um, we're looking at options for doing large scale surveys of farmers themselves in Nepal, India and Bangladesh about what they anticipate will be changes to their production practices as a result of COVID-19. And that work is underway with a, a larger group of people um, that are on this call. And um, I'm just, with Amjath's leadership, we are also doing um, panel surveys of uh, feed mills in Bangladesh. The reason why we've started to do that is because feed mills absorb almost all of the maize that is produced in Bangladesh and then goes to the poultry and uh, aquacultural industries. So we're still trying to gauge exactly what the implications are, but we'll have at least the first two weeks of panel data quite soon. And I think once that's available, we will be able to start trying to share that. And um, I'm Jeff again is um, in contact with colleagues at FAO and we're even having discussions about whether it's possible to have a, to develop a food systems health dashboard online where we present the data. So you can go and you can look and understand what is happening in different locations of the country and the country as a whole with respect to indicators for food systems health and um, the health of these SMSEs that you, you described. So uh, Tim, uh, what I will do is that uh, we let's end this uh, uh, presentation with two more, so you can get to sleep. <laughs> and right. another another meeting afterwards, but that's okay. okay. So there are two questions. One from uh, uh, our colleague P uh, PV, and I'm trying to find his questions. Are yeah, three questions. Uh, he says thanks for the great presentation. I have three questions. One, what were what water saving approaches, if any, have been adopted during dry season cultivation? Two, is that a concern on how salt water intrusion may impact the agriculture due to storms, cyclone, et cetera? And three, what are the lessons learned from this work? And then we also have another present question, last question for uh, uh, that I will do is that Anna Brennis has a question she left already that, thank you, Tim, nice presentation, re-digital re services. I'm curious how much authority, local watershed authorities have over regulating water resources impacts to wetlands, aquifer drawdown, irrigation, canal levels, etc. So you will have four those four questions and then we'll end the presentation. <laughs> okay. Um, well I assume I assume the questions are aimed a little bit towards the Bangladesh case. So I'll answer from that perspective. Um, what water saving practices are available for potential use in, in the dry season? Um, if, if the question was with respect to the irrigation uh, that I discussed and the potential for expanding irrigation during the dry season, um, there are a variety of planting techniques and other approaches that CISA has worked with. For example, the zero tillage seeding or the, the, the seeding with the power tiller operated seeders or conservation agricultural techniques that are absolutely aimed at water savings. Um, that said though, 
We've also done large scale studies of the overall dynamics of the estuary system in Bangladesh. And we're working on putting this together into a publishable report. Um, but we've actually modeled the implications of water withdrawal from the Delta ecosystem for irrigation, where we assumed, well, let's cover all fallow land with a dry season rice crop, because that would be the most water consumptive crop that you could possibly grow. Um, and look at what the implications are for water flow in the overall Delta ecosystem. And also look at the implications, you asked about saltwater intrusion, about whether the withdrawal of water for agriculture has any effect at all on um, intrusion of salt. And what we found is that because there's actually so much water that pulses through the, you know, the, the, the water systems, um, I mean, some people even refer to the, the Ganges and the tributary systems in the region as the Ganges water machine. There's so much water that comes through um, Bangladesh um, on a regular basis and is pushed out to sea that if you take any of it out for irrigation, even at the most consumptive level possible, at the highest rates possible, it makes almost no impact whatsoever on the overall flow of water. It also makes very, very limited impact on the uh, intrusion of salt water into the irrigation systems. Uh, or sorry, into the canal systems at this point in time. Um, and one would assume that if it's uh, being used for irrigated rice in this analysis as well, that you would have limited impacts on sol solinization of soils because crops would be grown under a water layer, um, which would limit to some extent salinity effects through evaporation and, and losses. Um, the thing that's useful to know about this and interesting, though, is that um, that dynamic does change over time. So we ran, if I recall correctly, 35 and 50 year climate change projections um, in, in these models. And we found that, uh, you know, after 35 and 50 years, you still you do start to see a small change in the salt water front if you take that much water off for irrigation. Um, but it's relatively small. But the answer to that would be crop diversification. Um, don't only grow rice, grow other crops that are less water consumptive and that would manage the situation uh, a bit better. So those are some of the things that we've learned in, in that and we'll keep you posted as we get those reports ready to be shared. Um, there was another question with respect to local water resources and watershed management and so on. And um, that's a very good question, but it's also a complicated one because uh, it, it depends on, on country and it depends on circumstance. Um, a colleague um, of ours, Anton Orfils, uh, working in Nepal, does a lot of work around collective action and management of water resources. And we can share some of his publications and insights with you there. In the case of Bangladesh, it is a, a, a lot more complex and complicated because there's an intense pressure on water resources and land and sometimes competition between agriculture and aquaculture and fisheries for water, depending on location. Um, but without going into too much detail, again, part of the work that we did in the targeting of irrigation that we discussed in the presentation and the work that we did with the, the Bangladesh Agricultural Development Corporation with the local currency support from USAID was to look at communities where there was less conflict around access to water and that, that they looked um, to be ideal for the, from the perspective of canal development and being able to cooperatively manage canals over time um, as opposed to other communities where it might be a bit more uh, challenging. And I think that's an important lesson to recall because you can do all your detailed science work behind a desk and technology targeting work behind a desk, but you still have to go to the field, you still have to interact with communities, and you still have to understand which ones are best bet locations to, to intervene. And that we did some of that work um, in that partnership with government and with the USAID mission in Bangladesh. Oh, thank you so much, Tim. And um, I think we'll let you rest now. <laughs> And I think I'll join the other call. Uh, and uh, but we have a lot of uh, again. I want to emphasize that there's a lot of other great work that has been happening um, 
uh, he, a lot of people, even Hosue, my colleague Hosue, saying it would be great to see a future presentation on the impact of environmental study on follow irrigation land. You just talked about it. Uh, lots of people, Patricia Orlowitz, uh, gave you a good shout out to him for your flexibility on your work with the government of Bangladesh, how you very networked and how you are very flexible and instrumental in the work really to follow Army Warm. Uh, we, we have so many uh, things that are um, uh, great work on policy from Christy Cook, my colleague at the policy division. Uh, so it's a lot of work that, uh, 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 oh, there's one question that I didn't, uh, uh, she talked about, thanks, can you let us know the average time to break even? Uh, that's Carol Jenkins, but I didn't know what she was mentioning about. <laughs> mm. She uh, was, she would be asking about, um, about the, about machinery. Yeah. Um, and uh, I won't answer it directly because it depends on which machine you're interested in um, and which crop you would use it for and which country you're in. Um, okay. But understanding those those issues are core to um, understanding and building business models around uh, successful machinery service provision. Anyway, we'll send you all these comments. I'll copy and paste it for you. <laughs> So you can sift and respond. Good, thank you. If needed. But you've already responded to many of them. But if you want to uh, highlight something, some other source, I'll send them to you and then you can uh, sift them through. But I just want to say uh, thank you so much, Tim, for doing this. <laughs> uh, it's very late. Your My pleasure. And, uh, and um, uh, all your team have worked with you uh, from uh, Summit, Erie, IFPRI, and all the uh, people that work with you are here. Uh, I'm, I'm very grateful. I saw your project sites. I'm so glad I came to visit before this lockdown in late February, early March. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, very impressed with your work. And also really want to thank the Bangladesh mission and Nepal mission also for um, your engagement with them. And uh, uh, just want to say also uh, the investment that they have done to in, especially with the CISA Bangladesh that you, you've presented was very instrumental. Uh, you could not have done it alone. And also, uh, of course, the gate, uh, our, our, the co-donors, the Gates Foundation who work in India, uh, where without that kind of support, all this thing would not have happened. So thank you so much, Tim. And uh, with this, I will end the presentation and uh, have a good day and hope to be safe. Uh, please be safe on this uh, coming um, cyclone, monsoon. Uh, 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 cyclone, right? That's what you call it there, right? Yes. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. there's different names. Yeah, but regions. So, um, yeah. please be safe and uh, thank you again. Thank you. And if I could also just say as, as a last thing, that's always always important is that again we wish to thank very strongly USAID and the Bill and Melinda Gates Fort Foundation um, and all of the additional co investments that have come into making the CISA program the the success, the integrated large scale success that it is. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tim. Everyone, the presentation I've ended, we will have a recording of it again, and then uh, we want, we will share it to you when, uh, uh, in an appropriate way. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye.